<laughs> it's October 30th, my birthday, the eve before Halloween, and I am Virtue here for the Big Vito brand and BigVito.com to talk about the results in my review of WWE Evolution, their first ever all-female pay-per-view type event. All right, so coming up this week on Friday, I believe it's Friday here, is Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia. A lot of controversy going in around that. Um, you know, I could sit here and do predictions about that show and preview and predict it. Even if there wasn't any controversy, to me, these are glorified house shows. So maybe on next week's Virtue's Brand of Wrestling, I will talk about the fallout of Crown Jewel. So with that said, let's get on with me talking about WWE Evolution. So apparently there was a dark match that they did not air, and it was uh, Rhea Ripley who successfully defended the NXT UK Women's Championship against Dakota Kai. Um, didn't even have a length of match on the Wikipedia page. So I didn't see it. I don't know much about it. I know who Dakota Kai is, so I can't say what I thought about it, really. So let's get on with the event. These are my movies of the week. There's two, and you'll love them. Some people won't, but we'll explain that later. So Evolution kicked off with the hot opener, of course, Lita and Trish Stratus. The Nostalgia Acts. They come out to the ring to have their match against Mickey James and Alicia Fox. Now, originally, it was supposed to be Mickey James and Alexa Bliss. Alexa was out with, I believe, a concussion or some type of head injury. She could not compete. At least they allowed her to cut a promo against Lita and Trish before she introduced her team of Mickey and Alicia. This match, it was what it was. You know, Trish and Lita did okay. You can tell their speed's a little bit slower because the way that women work today, they're all trained with the indie NXT style back when Trish and Lita did it. It was different. It was slower-paced matches. Yes, there were a lot of bra and panty, lingerie pillow fights, etc. back then. But when they did actually wrestle, I mean, they got – Lita got beat up by guys back then, but it, it was it was different. It was just different. So you could kind of tell that this match just wasn't – not that it was bad, but the, the generations were clashing. And, of course, you know, Mickey has worked with Trish in the past, so their stuff was okay. But Lita just seemed a little half-step off. But nonetheless, it served its purpose. Lita and Trish went over as expected. I believe if Alexa was healthy – they might have been able to get the heels over in that match because Alexa always seems to get, you know, when you think she's going to lose, she wins type deal. But with that said, maybe not because it was Lita and Trish and it was the hot opener. Usually you want to set the tone when the baby faces win. But it was what it was, nothing spectacular. Again, I actually thought the first half of this pay-per-view was crap. The second half business did pick up. We'll talk about that. Um, Hunter wants to make a cameo today. He hasn't made a cameo for a little bit. So here we go. Here is the good old Hunter. Nothing related to Triple H. Um, and look, he's already camera shy. All right, buzz away. He'll probably bark at me before this video is over. So let's get to the main card. We did start with, um, at, or sorry, the main card was Lita and Trish uh, going over Mickey and Alicia. After that, we had the 20... Women Battle Royal with a lot of nostalgia acts. Ivory was in it. Alundra Blaze. Sorry, Medusa. But nope, WWE's got to call her Alundra Blaze. Kelly Kelly was there. Tori Wilson. Uh, some smoking hot females. Nothing wrong with that. And, of course, you had your Nia Jaxes, your Ember Moons, Oscars, etc. Well, my predictions were it was going to come down to Nia and Ember Moon, and it did. How predictable is that? You have 20 women. And, you know, earlier in the week, I said those two were going to be the finals. I actually picked Ember Moon to win. They had Nia win, which, you know, there was a moment in the match where her and Tamina, who, you know, they're all related to 
in a way to Roman. I, I, of course, with Roman's recent leukemia um, diagnosis that he came out and told everybody, uh, there was a nice little cool moment with Naya and Tamina where they did the Roman ah, type thing, and then they proceeded to beat everybody up around him. That was pretty cool. Uh, but nonetheless, Naya throws over Ember Moon to win, which I probably should have said she was going to win because think about it. It was a feel-good moment um, because of Roman's announcement earlier in the week. And let's be honest, her, and we'll get to it later, but she's going to be the number one contender now for the Raw Women's Championship. And really, who else are you going to pick? Nia's big, believable. If your belt's around Ronda Rousey, even though they already had their match, it is what it is. And I think they're going to do it again. But again, nothing at Battle Royal. Woo. If this, let's get all the women out there at once. That's what WWE does. The next match was the final of the May Young Classic. And a lot of people said, oh, it was too short. I see that it went 10 minutes and 20 seconds. It is what it is. Remember when a 10-minute match used to be a long match on a pay-per-view? Now it's short. And the fact that it was the final of a May Young Classic tournament, which, you know, everybody, it's all about the wrestling. Well, Tony Storm defeated um, Shirai, another Japanese wrestler. I thought for sure that she was going to win last year. Karai Sane, Carrie Sane, however you say their name, she won it. And we know that Asuka was pushed to the moon as undefeated. And I just thought they were going to roll with NXT being a very friendly Japanese, you know, favorable, pushed brand. Well, they went with Tony Storm in this one. So, you know, it was what it was. She won the Mae Young Classic. She'll probably become a staple now uh, in the NXT brand, and we will see where it goes from there. But usually you would think that she's going to become the NXT Women's Champion at some point. And, of course, we had a six-woman tag match. Sasha Banks, Bailey, and Natty. Again, very thrown-together stuff to get all the females on the show. They defeated the Riot Squad. Um, and to this point, it was a feel, too much of a feel-good show. You had Trish and Lita go over. You had Nia win the Battle Royal, who, you know, was Roman's cousin. Uh, you had Tony Storm win. It was kind of the feel-good for her to win it. And then, of course, you have Sasha, Bailey, and Natty win it. It just felt like this was a house show. All the babies are going over. All the feel-goods are going over. So I really wasn't too impressed with this. I mean, it went 13 minutes. Uh, I'm surprised it went longer than the previous match for the Mae Young Classic, but nonetheless, it did what it, you know, Bailey and Sasha and Natty went over. Nothing spectacular, nothing memorable to this point. To me, Evolution was probably like a C minus, D plus show. Eh, meh. And I, I've heard some people say it was the best pay per view of the year. Now, I can see why maybe some of them said that. We'll get into it because the very next match, the NXT Women's Championship and Shayna Baszler defeated Karai Sane, who won the May Young Classic last year. And this was kind of a good move because, you know, Shayna Baszler is one of the UFC four horsewomen with those two other girls that actually showed up during this match and Ronda Rousey. And if they ever want to get to that point on the main roster where maybe they do the you know, the four horsewomen of Becky, Sasha, Charlotte, and Becky, Sasha, Charlotte, and Bailey, mind blank here, versus those four, for whatever reason, they can actually slow build this. So Shayna won the title back. Of course, shenanigans, as they, you know, she had her buddies out there that eventually distracted Karai saying enough. So Shayna could win the title, and they all rejoiced, and that was the end of the segment. So business picked up a little bit. The heel won. There was outside shenanigans. They were sitting in the front row. They got involved. You know, you need a little bit of that. Was it kind of just average interference? Yeah, nothing spectacular. But, you know, you got people talking about, up oh, the four horsewomen, will these three reunite with Ronda at some point? So all in all, you know, it was what it was. Now we get to probably the match of the night. Actually, for sure, the match of the night. And I would say it's a candidate for match of the year, and I want to talk about this. Um, Becky Lynch defeated Charlotte in the last woman's standing match. 
and to retain the SmackDown Championship. Charlotte's a superstar. When I saw her walk to the ring, and of course I was in New Orleans at WrestleMania and I saw that entrance, Charlotte is a bona fide, bona fide what a superstar should look like. Now, I'm not talking about her enhancements. She just gets it. Daddy Wu would be proud, is proud. He's getting to see it. And if I think that this evolution ever will actually mean what the title is, evolution, and there is actually a female match that will close WrestleMania, and I'm, I'm saying it's still less than a 10% chance, but the fact that one Roman Reigns, who is the only guy that Vince was comfortable enough to keep putting in the main event at Mania four consecutive years, he's out battling leukemia, which, again, I believe he's definitely going to get through this. Um, last time I did a video, it was recorded before that announcement, but I believe Roman will get through this. I, I'm hoping that they found it found it early enough, even though it is a relapse, but he's in good shape. He's in his mid-30s, and I think that he's one of the lucky ones that can get the best medical treatment there is because I'm sure WWE will help support him with this. He's out indefinitely, but I think we will get news one day that Roman is in remission from leukemia. Uh, it's not, you know, it's a blood cancer. You know, it can be serious. You, know, you have stem cell research. You have bone marrow transplants. The, you know, it's messing with your white blood cells. But at least there's no tumors, so he's not elderly. He's not a child. Relapses usually aren't very good for that end of the spectrum. But we will see. We will pray. And right now, Roman is more over than he's ever been because of cancer. It sucks. It's what it took. But I think that's going to be even more motivation. It, it is. And he's going to come back and it's going to be electric. But with that said, I think Charlotte can easily slip over into that Roman role. She's pushed as a baby face, as Ric Flair's daughter, seven-time champion already. The fans are going to repent. The fans are going to give her the Roman treatment. And I believe WWE should do that. Now, is she a better heel? Perhaps, you know. I don't think anybody's a better anything. I think if you're given enough time to present the character you're supposed to play, you can get it over. When people say natural this, natural that, that's just something easy to say because they like to see them as that particular character. So I don't buy into that. But Charlotte took these bumps in this match, and Becky did great too. She went over. To me, Charlotte proved that she's the best female wrestler on the women's roster. Now, I've said in the past I've liked Asuka. Well, she couldn't break the Japanese to English language barrier for what how Vince McMahon likes to present his product, and Asuka's been buried on the main roster. Charlotte has the Ric Flair bloodline. She's pretty decent on the mic, you know. Not you know, like Roman, not the best. Probably would be better if she could shoot or semi-shoot than be scripted, but she's got the look. She looks tough and legit, and I'm telling you, I could see her versus Ronda Rousey maybe to close out WrestleMania 35. Again, it's less than a 10% chance, but if the first WrestleMania, if Roman obviously is probably going to be out indefinitely, um, if that could be the main event for WrestleMania for the first time, if they really want this evolution to mean something, there you go. But nonetheless, this was a fantastic match. Um of course, in a match like this, especially with females that don't do this kind of stuff all the time, there were some moments, you know, maybe they could have been better, but I'm telling you what, there was crazy stuff. They slammed each other onto the chairs, the ladders, the tables. It was probably, again, the best female match uh, on the main roster, at least this year, if not in history. These girls brought it. They delivered. It's what I like to see. Um, a lot of people liked wrestling. I like sports entertainment, and the last woman standing match with all these bumps and spots did that, and it was 28 minutes and 40 seconds. And this saved the pay-per-view. And, of course, we had Ronda versus Nikki. Big match Nikki. Wait, that's big match John. I'm sorry. It was what it was. You know, Ronda's not the best wrestler in the world, but – She's a fighter. She's a scrapper. This match went 14 minutes and 15 seconds long. Ronda retained. But they did make Nikki, especially the first half of the match, look dominant. 
Now, I heard people say there, you know, and I was guilty of saying this on Twitter, that some spots seemed a little sloppy. And then I saw what Disco Inferno tweeted. And he said, you know, in a, if everything was synchronized perfectly, it wouldn't be that believable of a fight. The only thing that would be missing would be trap trapezes and nets. But the fact that, you know, there were some sloppy parts to this match, not botches necessarily, but that, that's how real fights go down. If you watch a UFC fight, there's some times they're rolling around on the ground or they fall awkwardly or they it's it's because real fighting, there's real trying to get away and this and that. And it's just funny that wrestling fans just want everything to be perfectly, no botches, in sync, flipping and flying, slow or fast paced, nothing slow, nothing half assed. And is that really believable? Then at that point, like I said, the only thing that's missing there are the trapezes and the nets. So I thought Ronda and Nikki did what they needed to do. Um, why did it go on last? Because Ronda Rousey is mainstream. Uh, Nikki Bella is on Total Divas and this and that. Charlotte and Becky are just two wrestlers. So the, the Raw Women's Championship is the A show, the A title for women. Sorry, but Becky's SmackDown title is the B title because SmackDown's the B show. I thought this was appropriate for the order. It, it it is what it is. You know what I mean. And and I felt that the second half of this pay per view saved it. Uh, I could easily say from the NXT Women's Championship match on that this show was an A minus. So I put my grades together. I'm going to give it a B minus. This show was a B minus. My status quo for a lot of WWE pay per views because I always if the talent delivers for what they're given. I like to go with around a B grade. Uh, it has to be super, super, like really great wrestling matches or, or some type of swerves or angles for me to get to that A minus or higher range, or it has to just be a complete dumpster fire for me to go down into the C range. I don't know if I've really given anything D or F because I invest my time into watching, and there's always something decent on the show to keep it from that low of a grade. So we're going with B minus. You know, and I can get criticized. People could, it says this, you know, this was the best pay-per-view of the year. Are you just being biased because it was all females and you want to show that feminism support? It wasn't an A show. You know, it wasn't an A minus show. Could it have been a higher B show, like a B plus or B to, have to some? Perhaps. It just felt very status quo WWE. Let's talk about this week. Roman Reigns, you know, Roman Reigns. Announced his leukemia. He's out indefinitely. So let's pray for him. WWE said, no, we're still going to go do Crown Jewel, despite the controversy with that journalist that was murdered in the Turkish uh, Saudi Arabia consulate in Turkey. He was murdered. They had the fake stunt double, a cover-up, all that good. WWE's committed to go to Saudi Arabia to do this event, and the stock price has plummeted. Last check, it was in the lower 60s. Folks, a couple weeks ago, it got as high as the mid-90s. And for the longest time, the last month or two, it was hovering in the 80s. This is what happens. You know, but a year ago, before the Fox deal, before the USA deal, before they did big events, not named WrestleMania, like in Australia, like in Saudi Arabia, WWE stock was under $30 a share. So if it flatlines at 50 or 60 and it just kind of stays there, they get through the Saudi Arabia controversy – that's a pretty good year for WWE because they made a lot of money. They have these new deals, and their stock is going to be up from what it was a year ago. But I like how people saw how it peaked at the 90s, which probably was you know higher than it really needed to be, and then it's come back down and people are calling failure. No, 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 no. This isn't how it works. If they crash down to where they used to be and then the stock went lower than it has been in five years – now we say it's time to panic. But until then, it's not time to panic. If it's higher than it was previous fiscal year, something's being done right in terms of them making money. Um, just because it shot up to ridiculous numbers and it came back down because of some controversy and an illness, which, you know, who knows exactly why. Probably more of the Saudi Arabia controversy than Ro Roman's illness. But Roman's illness shows the instability of the main event now. You know, is Brock coming back? But people didn't like him as a part-timer. Is Strowman going to finally get pushed? We've heard Drew McIntyre's name brought up. There's instability right now in 
the WWE main event scene for the Universal title, at least on Raw and the main show. I'm going to do another conglomerate show for the Big Vito brand, for NoDQ.com, and for WrestlingWithWrestling.com probably later this week. And I'm going to talk about that, what should be next for the Universal title. And I'm going to talk about Strowman, Lesnar, what makes most sense for stability. I'll even maybe briefly talk about the, the WWE title part, part of it on SmackDown with AJ Styles. So there's going to be a lot to uh, that I talk about to be continued like there always is with WWE. And it seems like it always stems on controversy. So... I'm recording this after Raw this week. Uh, they're play, they played out Roman's leukemia quite a bit, showed his speech quite a bit. Again, I've stated on Twitter, you know, this is a relapse of a serious disease that kills people. But Roman seemed somewhat confident to me last week that he's going to beat this and fight this. I think he knows more, you know, better details of, of his prognosis than, than we do. And I, WWE, he must have shared that with them because – you know, granted, he wants to be the face of this leukemia thing, but I think if he knew he was on his, you know, death row, that it would he would be pulled back behind the curtain a lot more, and, and we wouldn't be seeing this disease front and center to get Ambrose over as a heel, nonetheless. You know, so we pray for Roman. I feel good that he's going to be in that 80 percentile or higher of a to go back into a remission, but the question is, how long is it going to take, and when? But luckily, I think he's in good hands, and he will beat this. To be continued. So with that said, let's briefly talk about my movie, two movies of the week. And like I said, it is 1 o'clock in the morning. It's after all. I'm on vacation this week. Uh, I've been drinking some Heineken. So I'm not belligerent. I'm not drunk. But you know, I'm feeling a little bit, you know, more uh, tipsier than normal recording those videos for you. So I hope it turns out okay. But nonetheless, my birthday today, October 30th, and of course I love Halloween on the 31st. I've seen the Jasons, the Freddies, the Halloween movies this um, season. You know, they all start showing them on AMC and various channels. I think that uh, I've heard how the Rob Zombie Halloweens get dogged enough, especially because now this new Halloween movie is out and people are praising it. And I said, you know, it's better than a few of the other Halloweens like H2O, Season of the Witch, and Resurrection. But there are a lot of the other Halloweens I like better. The all, you know, all the ones with Donald Pleasance and, of course, the two Rob Zombie ones. So here's Halloween, the unrated director's cut, and, of course, the unrated director's cut of Halloween 2. And I like both of these by Rob Zombie. Obviously, the first one, he goes back into M uh, Michael's childhood, and we get a deeper story. It's a Rob Zombie-delivered story, though. If you watch the original Halloween, that kid looked like a normal kid. The two parents looked like they were middle class or high, you know, just nor They were out on a date, and they came home, and the Rob Zombie portrayal was like a, like a trailer park-type family. And, you know, neglect and abuse and divorce and, you know, but that's his vision. You know, he's a gore horror fan and he likes to to do that type of raunchier gore horror. And that's fine. That's what makes Rob Zombie unique. And I like how he portrayed that. The first half of the movie was younger Michael showed them the kid murder his mate, you know, do his first murder before even his sister. Very, very, very cool how he did that. And, of course, you know, I had Dr. Loomis. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of anybody not named Donald Pleasance, but the fact that Malcolm McDowell did the best he could, I enjoyed it. Um, they, You know, Rob Zombie used a bigger guy to play Michael Myers, more like a Kane Hodder type, bigger Jason. But, you know... It was Rob Zombie's take. Now let's talk about this one. You know, it wasn't my favorite Halloween of all of them, but I liked it. The White Horse, Rob was doing his thing. You know, he was it was being artsy. He was showing that Michael had visions of his family. And and I'm telling you what, this is not a horrible movie. If you ever watch this, the the ending, and I think it's the director's cut, they play that song, they show J um 
they show uh, not Jamie because that's Daniel Harris that played the Jamie um, Laurie Strode, and the way they ended the movie, fantastic. And again, it's not the best one, but for the people that said this is the worst one, art is subjective. So I support Rob Zombie. I love all of his movies: The House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's Rejects, Thirty One. Uh, the witch movie, which, you know, was the, the uh, Salem witch movie. The, the two Halloweens. I like Rob Zombie's work. And he's redoing, not redoing, but he's doing a trilogy now to The Devil's Rejects, House of a Thousand Corpses. And we're going to get that next year. So everybody can criticize him saying he's just a, he's just a gore whore um, advocate, whatever. But I think his movies are gems. And for the for people that hate them, that motivates me to to know I'm glad that I like them. I'm glad I'm on that side of the fence that says Rob Zombie is creative and his vision for what scary and horror should be, he delivers how he wants to. And, yes, he's a big fan of 70s and 80s horrors, and you can see that. He doesn't plagiarize. I think he just is inspired by the Texas Chainsaw Massacres and that type of – that era of uh, horror movies and and – for him to be able to deliver that type of stuff in today's movie, you know, world where all we get are remakes or we get jump scare, uh, supernatural, like poltergeist type stuff or conjuring, exorcism type stuff, it's boring. So keep it going, Rob. Um, we appreciate you here on the Big Vito brand. But that's it. So I'm going to watch Halloween on my birthday and I'm going to watch Halloween 2. The Rob Zombie ones on Halloween. I said I was going to do that uh, every year now going forward on my birthday and Halloween to support the two Rob Zombie Halloweens, which I think will go down as cult classic hidden gems. It's going to have their haters, but it's going to they're going to have their supporters. So that's it for this week's Virtues brand of wrestling here on the Big Vito brand and BigVito.com. I am Virtue. You can follow me on Twitter at NoDQ underscore Virtue. And I will see you next week, and we'll talk more about WWE. is brought to you by the Big Vito brand. You can check us out at BigVito.com or HarlowInc.com.